Hello everyone and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Today we're going back to the Middle East for a new development that's unfolding right now. It's happened twice in the past eight days and the Pentagon just acknowledged it yesterday. I'm talking about airstrikes against targets in Libya. The targets that were hit were Islamist militias in and around Tripoli. The bombings killed roughly 20 people and destroyed a weapons depot, a warehouse, vehicles, rocket launchers, and other Islamist assets. The militias were advancing through the city and toward the main international airport. And even after they sustained those two airstrikes, the militants successfully captured the airport. Now they basically control Tripoli, which is Libya's capital city. The Guardian said that this recent fighting in Libya was triggered by elections last month. The Islamist parties lost the elections, so they raised up a group of militias that calls itself Operation Dawn. And over the past couple of weeks, they've taken over parts of Libya from Libya's weak House of Representatives, which is supposedly Libya's official government right now. Now that the Islamists have taken over the capital, they're burning down the airport and proclaiming their own new government. So here we have yet another crisis, yet another country on the verge of outright civil war, yet another example of Western intervention that contributed to a country spinning out of control. But that's not even the big story here. The big story is who was behind the airstrike. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. The larger story that I want to focus on is actually these airstrikes, even though they, they didn't obliterate the Islamists, they're now all over the news. These were two long range operations that apparently required coordination between uh, multiple countries and even aerial refueling in order to reach their targets. But it wasn't Libya's official government that launched the mission. It wasn't France. It wasn't a Western coalition. It wasn't NATO, it was Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. Now, Libya, as you know, is a fragmented mess. Muammar uh, Gaddafi dictated to it for four decades. Then NATO and, and the rebels got rid of him. A and Libya had the, the National Transitional Council. Then it had the General National Congress. Then it had the House of Representatives. Now it has the Islamists. It basically has two rival governments and two rival militia groups. And the governments have no relationship with those militias. In less than three years, we've had more so-called governments in Libya than, than you can even keep track of. But the big takeaway, as I said a moment ago, the big takeaway from these recent airstrikes that I want you to think about here is the fact that the United States didn't even know about them. The reports are that Egypt and uh, the UAE just decided to go it alone and to completely disregard the Americans. The New York Times, which, which broke all of this uh, just a few days ago, said that America was completely left in the dark. And now American diplomats are upset because they're afraid that these strikes are going to destabilize Libya even further. Let's look at Daniel 11. I just want to read to you one verse that we've, we've mentioned to you before, but it's, uh, you know, it's almost laughable, really, when you think about diplomats here in the States that are upset about what others are doing that might supposedly destabilize Libya when it's America in the first place that really threw that country into turmoil that destabilized it to begin with. Now, I think the, the strike, though, led by the UAE and, and, and Egypt, it shows how Middle Eastern nations are basically leaving the United States out of it, not even checking in. As I said, the New York Times pointed out that the U.S. was completely in the dark on this. How revealing this is. 
If you want to make a move now in the Middle East, if you want to gain some leverage now in the Middle East, it doesn't much matter what the Americans think, does it? Not anymore. Not anymore. In Daniel 11 here, and verse 40, it's talking about this clash coming between the king of the north from Europe and the king of the south. There in the Middle East, it says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him with, uh, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. This is a, a modern-day uh, crusades-like battle between two, uh, two groups of nations, one in Europe, one in the Middle East. And it's motivated largely by religion in both cases. But what I want to point out here is something that my father brought out on the Key of David just a few years ago. And how that this is, I mean, this is a spectacular clash that basically leads the world right into the Great Tribulation. And the United States, the people of Manasseh, are nowhere mentioned in the prophecy. They're gone. They're invisible. Just like the United States is in the Middle East right now, its policies, it's the, the story, you could say, of the incredibly shrinking uh, superpower. Here these pretty complicated airstrikes are carried out just in the last few days. And supposedly the world's great superpower, supposedly, uh, doesn't even know anything about it totally in the dark. Now, these airstrikes carried out by Egypt and the UAE, they pretty much have punctuated the end of America's influence in the Middle East. That's how significant uh, this is. Now, the U.S. still has, you know, somewhat of a, a diplomatic presence. It still has embassies in a lot of these countries. Well, not in Libya, actually. <laughs> but it still has somewhat of a diplomatic presence. But pick any hotspot in the Middle East. Pick any hotspot in North Africa. And then consider, well, what impact, what influence does the United States still have? And then see if this isn't the fulfillment of prophecies such as this in Daniel 11, where you have these tremendous clashes between these, these huge movements, these huge powers. And the U.S. is nowhere to be mentioned. We've come to a turning point. Nations in the Middle East, North Africa, they don't have to really factor in Washington anymore. Another report I just saw the other day here, Iran sends tanks to Iraq to fight ISIS. Well, that would have been a big shock just a few years ago. Iran sending tanks into Iraq? Well, now that's just common. And the United States doesn't really care about those sorts of things. Well, in this case, I suppose you have this most unlikely alliance now developing between the U.S. and Iran because of the, the, the spread of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Pretty amazing to look at all of these, these bizarre and, and ironic and, and tragic correlations you know, the U.S. going in to free Libya from Gaddafi's reign, Gaddafi's rule. And then just a year later, you have the very Islamists that we turned the nation over to, basically running the, the Americans out of Benghazi and killing people along the way, an ambassador and three other Americans. The reason why we keep talking about Libya is because it really is a dramatic symbol of America's failed policies in the Middle East. It really is a dramatic symbol of America's decline in power. Let me just show you this slide from Powerline, the blog. Notice the title there. No longer even leading from behind, President Obama is out of the loop in Libya. I mean, early on, that was sort of what we we're out there broadcasting that, look, we're not going to be the big, you know, assertive one out front. We'll still lead, but we'll lead from behind and we'll let others sort of catch up 
and take the lead. Well, we've gone from that to now we don't even know. We don't, we're not even in the loop, as that blog brings out. We're completely surprised and shocked. And then our representatives are upset that maybe what Egypt or the UAE are doing is going to make things worse. This blog posting, the author there goes on and quotes a, a policy expert who said the reason uh, the, the strikes even happened shows just how dissatisfied the Egyptians and the Emiratis are with America. And the fact that we haven't done anything, we haven't taken any action to stabilize the nation of Libya. He points out how so many of them are aware of the growing anarchy throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And some are trying to intervene to do something. This power line uh, posting uh, quotes the State Department saying that its position on Libya uh, urges all factions to come together to peacefully resolve the current crisis. This is what the United States has been reduced to. Just a few words, urging people to make peace, urging both sides to come together, pleading for there not to be an escalation in violence. That's the best that the United States can do. I mean, Washington is just at a complete loss in Libya. Wouldn't you say that? We looked at what some of uh, uh, this administration has done in, in recent years, just on a program we had uh, posted last week. We talked more about um, Libya, and then you add this most recent development to the list, these bombing campaigns that the U.S. knew nothing about. And I mean, it's worse than America just being on the sidelines. It's as if America is outside the stadium and way off in the far reaches of the parking lot. A distant observer. You'll remember all the things we've, we've brought out, like in that program last week, uh, the White House press secretary talking about this administration contributing to the tranquility of the world. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry saying that Americans should be proud of this administration's foreign policy, of its peaceful diplomatic efforts, saying that, that we had the facts to prove it, the, to, to prove the success of this foreign policy. You go back to 2011, again, uh, Gaddafi had been deposed, and, and here was the United States president saying everything in Libya is going to be uh, great. The new and democratic Libya that's what we were celebrating in 2011. Then we had the Benghazi attacks in 2012. Uh, and then we've pointed you to the most recent events. This summer, America having to shut down its embassy in Tripoli due to the ongoing violence between these terrorist militias. And then the crazy development just a couple of weeks later where the Department of Homeland Security lifted a ban on Libyans studying you know, at flight schools or, or uh, uh, nuclear training facilities in the United States, basically arguing that the relationship between the US and Libya had been normalized. Here it's in turmoil, it's in chaos, and you still have leaders in the United States saying, well, everything's okay. We don't even have an embassy open there anymore. And now you add to this, to this growing list, nations there in the Middle East ordering bombing campaigns, and the Americans just completely in the dark. Well, we've, we've certainly been preparing you for events just like this, like with my father's article back in 2011, Egypt and Libya to join Iran's terror network well, so far you haven't seen Iran involved directly, but we certainly see the, the terror network, don't we? There's more to be fulfilled in terms of Bible prophecy, but we were telling you long before, you know, Powerline pointed it out this, this week that the U.S. was basically going to be out of the loop, to use the words that Powerline used, my father pointed out in that article 
how that, that NATO knew almost nothing about the, the rivals that would replace Gaddafi. You would think that would be an important consideration in 2011 before you remove the dictator. Well, if we get him out of the way, if we're just going to send bombs in and then, and then uh, leave and hope that it gets better, shouldn't we understand who's going to take over in his absence? Shouldn't we at least investigate who might rise to the top if you take away the, the dictator with the strong hand? That wasn't done. As my father brought out in that article, he said there's no way, <laughs> there's no way that Iran and the forces of terror won't take advantage of a situation such as that. This is one particular quote from that piece where, if you pick it up in the middle, he says, we are rejoicing about the overthrow of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi while we should be mourning. He predicted this because it's based on prophecies. You can go on and read the next few verses uh, here in Daniel 11 and see how that, that Libya and, and other nations as well are mentioned specifically in this prophecy right there in Daniel. And that's what uh, booklets like this are, are based on. Libya and Ethiopia in prophecy. Ethiopia is included in this because it's mentioned in the same passage. It's a fascinating study that you need to order and include in your library. It's free of charge. We offer it without cost or obligation to you. Going back to the material in this and in that article that my father printed in 2011, uh, he said quote, NATO just wants to bomb Libya and go home. And that's what it did, led by the United States. We bombed it, and then we went home. And now here we are. And look at Libya today. Here we are in 2014, and, and all, although we haven't seen Iran uh, directly take over Libya yet, uh, we can certainly see, we can certainly see who has been right about Libya. It's the prophecies of God. Make sure that you go to thetrumpet.com and get your free copy of this, of this little booklet, which gives you a, an accurate and detailed uh, forecast of what's ahead. In, there in North Africa, there in Libya, and in Ethiopia. And as you study this, make sure that you continue to watch for those headlines like we saw in the New York Times a couple of days ago, the bombing campaigns led by Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and the U.S. completely in the dark. I mean, that is significant. It really does highlight a turning point, and it really is illustrative of just how absent the United States is from the Middle East and the developments there. Uh, in the headlines. So again, Libya and Ethiopian prophecy, it's available to you free at thetrumpet.com. We thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time uh, on The Trumpet Daily.